Well, good afternoon. I'm Martha Minow. Uh, somebody left a hat and scarf, and we'll need it this weekend, so don't forget it. It's with uh, real delight that I welcome back to campus Professor Spencer Overton, who has so many roles, and I could spend the whole hour describing his work and his accomplishments, but I will be really brief. He is the uh, tenured professor uh, at George Washington University and also the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. He is one of the nation's leaders in both the study of elections and election law and the practice. And among his many, many roles that he has uh, played, they include publishing an important book, Stealing Democracy, The New Politics of Voter Suppression, and serving as a commissioner on a commission on federal election reform, uh, where he actually dissented from the commission's recommendations with regard to voter ID. He is also was a critical member of the transition team uh, for President Obama uh, and went into the administration where he served in the Department of Justice, the Office of Policy uh, Planning. And his work, therefore, is at the juncture of thinking about how do we, on the ground, deal with the election system we currently have, and as an academic, how do we stand back and make it better? His topic here today, as you know, is to voting rights in the age of Black Lives Matters and Dreamers, and Spencer, Professor Overton, thank you so much. Jane Minow, thank you. So I want to definitely start off by thanking uh, Dean Minow. She was my Civ Pro uh, professor here when I was uh, first first semester, and so I'm so delighted uh, that she's she's leading this law school. Uh, you know, I graduated in 1993. I came back in 1999. The relationships here for me. Uh, one of my roommates, Ron Sullivan, I think, is on the faculty, uh, perhaps here. Uh, Ken Mack was my balsa big brother and my co-fellow uh, here when we, I was in the, the Houston Fellow. Uh, property uh, had, had Frank, Frank Michaelman, uh, who was uh, a major mentor, and uh, Randy uh, for, uh, for contracts, Randy, Randy Kennedy. Uh, and Lonnie Guineer, when I came back as a fellow, allowed me to teach a couple of her classes and gave me great feedback on, on my work and uh, look up uh, to, to her. Uh, now, it was not all uh, glory days here, right? We certainly had our share of challenges. Uh, faculty diversity was really big. Uh, I came the year after uh, Derek Bell uh, left, and we had a uh, a number of, of painful episodes, right? But there's no denying that those experiences shaped many of us as we uh, entered into the Obama campaign and into the uh, administration or into other forms of, of public service or private sector or uh, the uh, academy uh, here. I uh, also want to acknowledge Simone Ajoma, who's my executive assistant at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies uh, here and is uh, on her way to law school. So I want to talk today a bit about, and, and Professor Freed here, uh, very, very good to see you. Always respected your work uh, here, and I look forward to our lunch. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter and dreamers and put that in the context of uh, voting rights. Um, within the past few years, we've seen the emergence of young people of, of color, you know, Black Lives Matter in terms of uh, uh, substantive goals, protecting black lives and bodies, ending mass incarceration, police brutality, uh, interesting, uh, you know, decentralized, right, dispersed. Uh, there's a deference to a grassroots action and local uh, action, not just one uh, central platform uh, uh, here, right? Looks different in each city. Uh, certainly there's some criticisms of, of Black Lives Matter in, in terms of uh, lack of specific demands, lack of traditional leaders, not connected, as Randy would say, to the politics of respectability, uh, right? Uh, not uh, being able to distinguish uh, those folks who 
uh, are part of a mob uh, from those who are in Black Lives uh, Matter. Right? Uh, we also see the Dreamers, movement of young citizens, uh, undocumented uh, many, who recognize the humanity of the undocumented to, uh, to stay, uh, to work, uh, to live, to be educated. Uh, on one hand, there's a real, Larry, there's a real uh, politics of respectability there, right? Hey, the model citizens here who are smart, uh, but for this formality, uh, they would be uh, entitled to all the privileges that we have. Brought here through no fault, faults of their own, largely nonpartisan, uh, really working to get the GOP on board. On the other hand, you know, revolutionary people who are coming out of the shadows to become politically involved. Many people who can't uh, vote, right, but have a voice and certainly targets of xenophobia and nationalism here, right? So now, on one hand, uh, parts of our political system have responded to both of these groups here. You know, the DREAM Act has not passed, but certainly the president has moved in terms of uh, DACA uh, uh, here. Uh, and certainly he's been criticized, right, by others uh, for moving on that. Uh, there have been major moves on the state level in terms of in-state uh, tuition rates for undocumented uh, high school graduates. Uh, with regard to Black Lives Matter, we see the presidential candidates responding to them, at least on the Democratic side. Uh, arguably, the, pres the president's uh, move with regard to the 21st Century Commission on Policing is in part a response to some of their efforts. Um, so I'm less concerned with these individual movements and I'm more concerned with the long game, the long game in terms of democracy. Uh, black Lives Matter, Dreamers, they represent a new black and brown activism that will mature into broader political movements that use conventional structures of power and uh, you know, they, they, they represent the fact that our country is changing rapidly and is becoming much more racially diverse. You all know the numbers. Babies of color make up a majority of newborns. Uh, less than three decades, the country will be majority minority because people of color are younger uh, and disproportionately non-citizens will have to wait another 10 or so years until people of color make up the uh, majority of the uh, voting eligible population. So, sounds like all we gotta do is exercise, eat well, Stay in shape, and you know, uh, all will be good. We just have to wait around long enough, and it'll be kumbaya, right? Progress will roll in on the wheels of inevitability, uh, right? Uh, obviously, I don't think that that's the case, and, and th that's my central question today, right? And I don't have answers. I'm really kind of teeing up questions uh, here, and the big question, of course, is despite this changing America, our ability to recognize a multiracial democracy is not guaranteed. Our democratic institutions are not necessarily set up to encompass this new uh, America uh, here. So how do we set up structures now that allow for this transition, this transition in a way that's peaceful, uh, transition in a way that you know, reflects the interests of all, uh, that protects uh, the interests of, of everyone and allows everyone a chance to uh, be heard. Uh, so we, we already see some evidence of the fact that you know, we don't see, let's say, proportional representation uh, quite yet. We, we see it in terms of black and white turnout in presidential elections, you know, pretty, pretty high. Black exceeding white in the last election and perhaps in 2008. But we see that uh, Asian American and Latino registration and turnout rates trail black and white registration rates by, 10 to 5, uh, by 15 to 20 points, right? And, and that's, that's among citizen voting age population, right? So that's not, oh, uh, because they're younger, or oh, because 
uh, hey, uh, a larger percentage are, are non-citizens. No, that, that's the CVAP uh, that is uh, there. Um, uh, another example is participation in local elections. Uh, after a, a white police officer shot and killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, we talked about Ferguson's government, which was overwhelmingly white. You remember there, Ferguson's mayor was white, as were five of six city council members and 50 of 53 police officers. But African Americans were 67% of the city residents. Right? And part of this disparity stemmed from low turnout in local elections. Uh, in Ferguson, blacks and whites about, turned out in about even rates, right, 54, 55% in presidential elections, 2012. But just a few months later, in April of 2013, in the local uh, uh, election, uh, whites were three times more likely to vote than African Americans. 17% uh, of whites uh, turned out to vote, whereas the estimate is, is that 6% uh, of African Americans turned out to uh, vote. Now, nationally, we see a similar phenomenon. Uh, about 60% of people would vote in a presidential election, where that number is about 27% in local elections. It's somewhere in between about 40 to 45 percent in midterm elections that are on the federal level, right? But it's as low as 27 percent as an average on the local level and, and many times is, is, much, is much less than that. Uh, and as overall turnout declines in these local elections, uh, the electorate just becomes less diverse uh, here, right? It, it, it's uh, less diverse. And, and we see this when we look at numbers. So whereas Latinos account for about 8 9% of the citizen voting age population, one study found that they account for only 3% of city council positions, 1% of mayors. African Americans account for about 12%, 13%. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of population, but about uh, less than 5% of city council people and 2% uh, of mayors. Uh, and um, so now the question here is, and that's just one indicator, that's just descriptive representation as opposed to substantive representation. I don't mean to suggest that uh, you know, voting has got to be by race here. Uh, so the question here is what can we do to des design structures to reflect our, our country uh, here. Uh, this is complicated by the fact that for the first time in a century, we see this effort to make it more difficult for people to vote, right? I mean, you've seen registration restrictions erected in states like Florida that have added paperwork requirements to registration drives. We've seen proof of citizenship to register uh, here. We've seen attempts to roll back election day registration in North Carolina, Ohio, several other states. Um, Florida and Iowa, the governors have enacted orders that prevent voting by former felons who've already served their time. And of course, we see the ID requirements popping up in terms of more restrictive ID requirements. We've got ID requirements pretty much across the country normally, but the question is, what is the substance of the requirement, right? So a uh, lot of restrictions that have been passed, uh, you know, various rationales, push for English-only ballots, we want to promote unity and English, uh, hey, former felons don't deserve to vote, uh, we've got to prevent fraud, prevent voting by undocumented uh, uh, folks, you've, you've heard the rationale. Um, my take here is that maybe there's some substance to that, but that politicians <laughs> manipulate rules in order to shape the electorate, that that's in there somewhere, right? We see it in gerrymandering. We shouldn't be surprised that it exists with regard to other uh, election uh, rules here. Um, and obviously, we can um, uh, you know, determine uh, election outcomes by shaving off certain percentages of percentage, uh, certain populations. So you might say, a skeptic might say, hey, why can't people just exercise individual responsibility, bring proof of citizenship to the polls, learn English, 
Why can't, you know, these folks just stay away from felonies? Hey, this isn't a, a big deal, right? But of course, the, the question here isn't about whether individual seniors or individual poor people or individual people of color are responsible enough to bring proof of citizenship to the polls or to learn English or to avoid a charge, right? Um, you know, certainly there were a lot of uh, folks of color who could afford to pay a $2 poll tax or who could pass a uh, literacy test. I mean, the problem here is that these devices shape the electorate and they, you know, thwart government of, by, and uh, for the people uh, here. If we're trying to determine the will of all citizens, obviously they get in the way. To be clear, individual responsibility, great value in most contexts. In this context, it's a little different. So now, we look for some answers here. And I don't have a lot of answers. I'm going to have a lot of questions, but here are some initial thoughts. How do we start to deal uh, with this? Uh, in the past, a lot of folks who have focused on civil rights issues have focused on the courts, have focused on Congress, right, in terms of answers. So question is, do we start there? I'm not overly optimistic about this particular court in terms of uh, solving some of these problems. Uh, obviously, we just had the Shelby County case where they rolled back the coverage formula with regard to Section 5. I'm troubled by some of the rationale and the language, especially when compared to Crawford, which was the ID case. Uh, you remember the, the justices voted to uphold the ID in Indiana, but roll back the coverage formula in Shelby County uh, here. Um, you know, the justices seem skeptical of showing of discrimination in Shelby County, despite, you know, 21 hearings, 90 witnesses, a 15,000 page record, right? Uh, in the Indiana ID case, of course, the justices acknowledged there was no evidence of fraud and yet, you know, defer to the legislature there. Uh, Indiana's photo ID, it passed on straight, straight party lines, right? Straight party lines is how it passed, right? Justice uh, Scalia, he discounted the overwhelmingly bipartisan 98 to 0 vote in the U.S. Senate. Uh, in support of Section 5 in the voting rights uh, uh, case. Uh, you know, he, he dismissed it as motivated by a perpetuation of ju racial entitlement that, you know, justified judicial intervention uh, here. Um, you know, textualists talk about kind of the problem with making up law, uh, but, you know, we've got a scenario where these five justices emphasized an equal states doctrine saying you've got to treat all the states the same and discounted the text of the 15th Amendment that explicitly authorizes Congress to enact legislation like the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the court also, this court also uh, brought out Citizens United, which allowed unlimited spending on elections and which led to the creation of super PACs and much more money in politics from billionaires, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, of course, the court may change uh, but again, I don't know that the court is, is key here. Uh, I don't know that it's key here. Congress, I'm skeptical about Congress's ability to address uh, this issue. Congress has not yet updated the Voting Rights Act. I don't know that it will, right? And you know, Congress hasn't been able to even respond to uh, Citizens United uh, here. Uh, and I think that uh, politicians, both Republicans and, and Democrats, will respond to Citizens United uh, because they feel as though there's a lot of money coming in from super PACs uh, against them. And this little part of the conversation in the talk is directed to uh, my friend Larry Lessig uh, here. And so the plea, Larry, is definitely we need overall change, we need public financing, we need some of the things that you and I have talked about. But right now, Larry, right now, Republicans and Democrats are getting together and they want to increase contribution limits. They want to increase contribution limits to parties from, let's say, $33,000 to $100,000 or more. 
they want to eliminate all coordination rules. Right now, um, a party can only coordinate with the candidate up to a certain amount, right? Otherwise, the, the, the spending by the party has to be independent, right? So they want to lift these coordination rules, and then they also want to increase contribution limits to candidates uh, when that money would be, they'd say, hey, when that money is used for get out the vote and you know, the, good, the good activities. The problem with this is that these larger contributions, they allow and they facilitate quid pro quo. Yeah, they get more money into the system so that you can respond to the super PAC, right? But they facilitate uh, quid pro quo. So I agree we need public financing long term. Right now, here's what the answer is. Right now, the answer is allowing unlimited coordinated spending but only from the first $200 an individual gives to a party. So in other words, right now, parties can, they can accept up to $33,000, and they have incentives to go after people who can afford to give $33,000. You, you focus your uh, raising on that, and, and a sidebar here is that uh, I raised like $3 million, uh, a million dollars in 2008 and, and uh, two million dollars in, in 2012 in terms of the president's campaign. So I've done real fundraising, right? And I know that when the contribution limits are higher, the most efficient way to raise more money and meet your goals is to focus on larger contributors because the transaction costs are lower, right? It just, it just kind of makes, makes sense here, right? So we've got to figure out a way to make these smaller contributions more valuable. And the way we do that is by saying, party, if there's a contested race in Colorado, you can spend as much as you want, as long as it comes from the first $200 of a contribution. So what that does is it gives parties incentives, even more of an incentive, to go out and engage more people and go for the smaller contributions, right? We're not gonna discriminate. The $33,000 contributor, their first $200 goes, you know, can be used in terms of Colorado as well, right? It can, it can be used, right? But there are obviously a lot more $200 contributors than there are $33,000 contributors, right? And so parties are gonna have more of an incentive to reach out because they'll be able to take that money and get it into competitive races. So this is a way to, as opposed to saying, oh, let's just get money out of the system, we don't need money, we're kind of the traditional liberal piece, this is a way to say, hey, we're gonna acknowledge money is needed, we're not gonna be blind to that, but we're not just gonna say lift all the contribution limits so that you can get your money. We're gonna say, hey, here's a way for you to get more money and also an incentive to engage people. Another plus of this is it doesn't cost a dime. There's no appropriations issue at all uh, here. It's a very simple fix and it's also administrable because right now they itemize, you know, itemized contributions or contributions over $200. So all of this is disclosed. So campaigns keep track of this anyway, right? So basically their spending limit on uh, these contested races would be based on how much uh, that they raise from those who give 200 less. Just another quick point here. One, what is $200? It's a $16 a month recurring contribution, right? So it's something that's very affordable, not by everybody, but by a lot of uh, people here, right? And then the other thing here is, if we do what they want to do and eliminate coordination rules, if I'm a congressional candidate, I'm going to stop raising $2,700 contributions. I'm going to focus on the $33,000 $33, contributors so that I can get them to give money to the party and then just I can coordinate with the party on my own campaign and I don't have to raise any $2,700 contributors, right? I can just focus on the $33,000 uh, contributors. That's much more efficient to me, but obviously it opens me up to 
quid pro quo corruption, right? But anyway, that's the campaign finance lobbying uh, sidebar uh, here in, in terms of Larry, but everybody generally. But but you know certainly uh, Larry has had a had a big platform on this. So my basic thing is I think we got to focus on local. I said hey courts aren't uh, necessarily the avenue. Congress isn't necessarily the prime avenue. I'm not saying we got to exclude them, but I think that the local piece is huge. And I think there are two parts of this. One, I think we focus too much on kind of the Fox, MSNBC horse race of the presidential election or the congressional elections. I think these local elections are incredibly important here. They're important because, one, I mean, just the issues that are covered, right? Policing, racial profiling, educational tracking, economic opportunity, uh, a variety of issues uh, uh, here, right? The Ferguson really may be an extreme example, but it exemplifies problems that are all over the country. Another piece of this is we've seen a major shift in the last few years. Do you know that half of, over half of all Asian Americans, over half of all African Americans, and over half of all Latinos who live in metropolitan areas live in suburbs now. So like in our minds, we often think of urban black synonymous, right? But that's not the case. Uh, the majority of African Americans in, 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 in metropolitan areas live in suburbs uh, here, and a third of our country's poor live in uh, suburbs. So uh, my point here is that there is, because of this demographic change, there's more of an opportunity for mismatch between elected officials and the people that they represent. There are other Fergusons that are out there. And again, it's not just African Americans in terms of gentrification who move out, but it's also just increasing numbers of uh, Asian Americans and Latinos as well uh, in particular areas. So this local piece is important. They allocate almost $2 trillion per year. I mean, they're incredibly important uh, uh, here. Also, there are more nonpartisan local elections than there are partisan elections. So, you know, there, there's a real opportunity to move ahead in a way that doesn't really have, that's not the horse race of the, you know, right left uh, partisan piece. So, I think we also need to think about election structures on the local and state level. Uh, like I said, we focus on the civil bullet of the Voting Rights Act or, you know, the big, the big court case in terms of federal uh, law. Uh, you know, I think we've got to focus on this local and state level, in part because of our constitutional structure uh, that delegates so much power uh, to the states to administer elections, right? And then we've got these 8,000 uh, different election uh, systems. Uh, you know, the, the, the local piece is huge. So what's that mean? Uh, that means Right now, average wait time for African Americans to vote in the country, 2012, 23 minutes. Latinos, 18 minutes. Whites, 12 minutes, right? That is a local problem, right? You know, some of it involved, may involve resources. Some of it may involve states ensuring that there are adequate resources. But some of that is a local problem, and not just a local problem where, like, Bull Connor is making lines longer in terms of particular areas. These are places where, in some cases, you know, you've got uh, elected officials of color, right, who are uh, in control in terms of uh, registrars and county clerks. Um, there's a strategy in the criminal justice context where you've got right and left coming together because of costs of incarceration and also kind of fairness justice issues. I think there's an opportunity here for that as well, especially when we talk about technology, right, the development of technology. So online voter registration, Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, right? Cost them 83 cents to process a paper registration, cost them three cents to process an online 
uh, uh, registration application. I think we can do that in a number of other areas. I mean, you all know the rest of them in terms of same-day registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, particularly important in terms of the younger demographic, in terms of Latinos. Um, States voting rights, state voting rights acts, you know, language access, restoring rights to former offenders. I mean, you, you've heard the, the variety of things that can and should be done uh, on the local level. So let me just stop here and invite comments and questions because, again, I don't have all of the answers. I didn't come in here with kind of a big theoretical framework other than really asking the question of how do we develop election structures so that we can usher in this new demographic. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I should have included alternative voting systems, I'm sorry. Uh, but let me just open it up for questions. Uh, and not just questions, but comments. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and go. Thanks so much. Uh, really, uh, such important set of questions and insights. Isn't there a risk of focusing on the local in terms of um, manipulation, in mm -hmm. terms of do we trust uh, mm -hmm. localities, and even with the technology, the, the issues about mm -hmm. the rigging of the voting booth? Mm -hmm. So I think that that is, of course, the whole purpose of preclearance. Right in terms of hey, you don't necessarily trust local officials to uh, do the right thing, and I think the trust piece is important. And I agree with you that uh, we need uh, some kind of check. I guess my concern is that I just think we're hyper focused on Congress and the federal level, and I just don't know that it is going anywhere. And I think that we're putting all our our eggs kind of in that basket. So I don't know that we should take Congress and other checks off. I just think that, A, we should focus on some, what are some common sense things we can do on the local level. I think there's some things that we could do on the state level that could be an effective check, right? Like California has the Voting Rights Act in terms of the, you know, the state's vote, state level Voting Rights Act. I also think on the technology side, uh, obviously it's important to have some checks. Uh, did this book, Stealing Democracy, and the chapter that I added in my paperback version focuses on machines, and I was really amazed at uh, how one can hack, let's say, a gaming machines, and how that same uh, issue uh, arises uh, there. Now, there are some things that are less subject to manipulation, like uh, registration roles in terms of online registration, um, poll books when people check in uh, that are maybe more efficient than uh, big, thick paper uh, books, right? And you can tell what precinct someone's supposed to be at and direct them there, all, all that kind of stuff, right? My take would be we should focus our technology on maybe some of those areas as opposed to initially, initially uh, the straight online voting, uh, right? Uh, but uh, I think evolution in terms of technology is inevitable, and you know I think we just have to, to move forward with the kind of proper safe, safeguards. Hi, so we talk a lot about um, how, when we talk about the civic engagement gap in communities of color, how you know structural laws prevent individuals from voting. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you can speak about how what, what reforms can help more institutions help people vote? You know, the most powerful incubators of civic engagement among people of color are churches, community groups, and labor unions, all of which are in decline. So mm -hmm. do you think there are reforms that can encourage civic groups to pick up the slack and, you know, kind of aside from the structural barriers of voting laws? Right. Uh, yes, and I am all for whether it's laws or kind of private action that would facilitate political actors and other actors to engage uh, citizens, right? So, for example, what I talked about with Larry here, right, in terms of this campaign finance piece, right? The whole notion is let's increase incentives for parties 
because we know that the transaction cost of small donors is higher, let's increase the incentives for them to ask and to reach out to uh, smaller contributors, right? Uh, and political science shows that the number one reason that anyone participates, whether it's voting or giving money or whatever, is because someone asked them, right? And so to the extent that we can design election structures to make it easy for people to be asked, I think that's what we want to do. And so I'm actually a little skeptical of those who would say, let's uh, take away um, parties or let's kind of suppress parties. I think it's important for us to kind of empower these groups and kind of give them incentives to engage others. I think that's like democracy and you know that that's what, what we want. So in terms of other specific uh, notions, I mean, so somebody has said, well, hey, could you allow for uh, unlimited coordination by super PACs for when they collect contributions under 200? Uh, I might be open to it. I mean, uh, people have talked about uh, uh, PACs, small donor PACs, right? Where basically, you know, a PAC can accept a contribution up to 5,000 and it can give a contribution to a candidate of up to 5,000, right? These small donor PACs, they might be able to accept a contribution of only up to 50 but maybe they could give a contribution of 50,000 to a candidate, right? To me, that's attractive again, giving actors incentives to go out and get more people engaged. So on the voting level or the contribution level, I think that's really important. So I agree with you, that's important. Lair? So we share the desire to try to encourage small contribution right. engagement. Um, um, but I'm, I'm just wondering how you understand the decline of parties here. I mean, right now the um, people less than 30% call themselves Republican, less than 30% call themselves Democrat. The majority, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 40 some percent, 44, 45% call themselves independent. So imagine your structure comes into play. It doesn't really even connect to the largest chunk out there. So mm -hmm. what what explains why we're losing you know, our understanding of uh, the parties, and, and does this suggest we should think about other ways to encourage more active or um, engaged party structures that could reach that 44%? Um, so I think that is a good point. Um, you know, I would imagine parties would say that, uh, I don't want to say they've been kind of discriminated against, but there's kind of been this move, for, you know, for folks to focus on, you know, candidates rather than parties. And there's a suspicion about party control and party power uh, and those uh, types of, of, of issues. Uh, I need to think more about what other things we might do to empower parties uh, here. Uh, I do know that parties feel like they're going to be replaced by super PACs, right, in terms of not just TV, but voter mobilization, research, you know, survey, et cetera. They feel as though a lot of this now is going to be done by super PACs because super PACs are not limited to 33,000 in what they can accept. They can accept a contribution of any amount, right? Uh, and so, you know, I just, I have to think more deeply about it. I appreciate you raising it, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry I don't have like a ready uh, stock uh, answer on, on that. Uh, I guess why I'm up here, huh? Um, hi there, I just wanted to say that I appreciate your focus on local politics, I think mm -hmm. it's often overlooked. Um, I think there are a few structural things that I've been thinking about, especially mm -hmm just Massachusetts based that could be really helpful. One is we've seen a movement towards um, all uh, at large city council districts instead of ward based districts. And that means that if you have a minority population, they're not gonna be able to have any electoral representation at the at large level because they can't get enough people to vote for the minority candidate. Um, when you keep things at the ward level, it allows local communities to elect people that look like themselves. It allows for better uh, actual representation of the local communities at the city council level. I do agree that city councils become then the springboard for state rep and state senate elections, and then state rep and state senate 
become con congressmen. And I think that we often forget that a, with the exception of maybe Trump, most people don't just come out of the woodwork. They do come up through the pipeline of the bench, of the party. To the point about parties, um, at least in Massachusetts, the majority of people are unenrolled, but they still use party very much as a shortcut to figure out who to vote for. Most people like to think of themselves as unenrolled, but the reality is when you look at voting patterns, mm -hmm. most voting patterns do not change when it comes to the Democra Democratic and Republican split down the line, in Massachusetts at least. It could be very different in other states. But here, we have an overwhelming number of unenrolled voters who still vote by party because it is a shortcut for policy. And for the role of parties, I think we've been focusing too much on money. The mm -hmm. role of parties needs to be providing good van, grassroots, and campaign tactics on the ground in local elections and not focus on money. Let that be the realm of the super PAC if that's what's going to be. But rather, why don't we make parties the actual foundation and cornerstone like Paul Wellstone wanted it to be for good grassroots campaigns to build a local and deep bench? Mm -hmm. So quick, quick point. Um, Two couple points. One, I uh, don't disagree with anything you've said. Um, I think there's still going to be a question of where does the money come from in terms of the party piece. So I think that there's always going to be, you know, candidates who are raising for parties, and we got to be concerned about where does that money come from because candidates are raising for it. I do think that this alternative voting system question is a big question in terms of the war piece, right? Because someone like Julius Chambers, who led LDF, really looked, I think, at single member districts as a transition type of thing, like a temporary fix to this issue that you've identified, right? But if we have, you know, uh, ranked choice voting or cumulative voting, arguably, even in an at-large system, right? Arguably, minorities can participate and elect a candidate of their choice. Now, interestingly, uh, this works in different ways in terms of different communities. Like, there are Latino civil groups, right, who feel, who, who are nervous about alternative voting because they feel like because their turnout lags 15 or, or 20 percent, that they can elect a candidate of choice in a single member district, right? But then if it was a different uh, alternative voting uh, scheme, that they may have less uh, influence here. On the other side, some political scientists have said that single member districts serve African Americans very well, but since jingles, Latinos have really not benefited in terms of proportional you know, representation uh, uh, here. So I think the evidence is kind of mixed right now. Hi. Uh, you go. Go ahead. Um, so I was very much interested in your focus on Black Lives Matter in particular. Um, two sort of questions or comments that have to do with that, though, is that it seems that the Black Lives Matter movement um, is very much a criticism of existing power structures and existing government structures, and also sort of a rejection based on deep alienation from that being um, an avenue that has been able to empower black and brown people. Um, and so I wonder if that's going to have some particular challenges translating into the local government mode of change that you suggest in, in two particular ways. One, I, I can see how um, it might be very difficult in terms of really broad systemic challenges um, to, to sort of see them happening in a sort of local government up type of way as opposed to a federal government sort of, for example, I think when Obama was elected, there was this sense that, oh, there's a different set of values that are going to get injected into the whole government system and sort of start trickling down policy-wise in a way that protects people differently. Um, and so I can see a lot of potential resistance to people, to, to how that would work, um, local government up. But I can also see how the second point is that I can see how it would be hard to mobilize the same grassroots movement that is based on essentially a lot of rejection of these structures to buy into local government as the first mode of change when I think people perceive local government as often the most corrupt thing that they in interact with and are more likely to trust you know, Obama and, and even Congress over their mayors. And mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it'll be interesting too to watch the Baltimore mayoral race, but. Um, 
I guess mm -hmm. those are those are my questions. For you. I, I appreciate it. I have some thoughts. I want to give everybody a chance, and I will will respond. I want to give everybody a chance to uh, talk, though. Who wants to? Who has an interest? Yep. I think I'll kind of piggyback off that point as well. Um, in thinking about individuals who live in a community, communities of color, right? And mm -hmm. you're in a city, and what if you're not necessarily informed, well informed mm -hmm. on what's going on? Um, because I, I think when individuals understand, oh, like I have a stake in, in this or this government works for me, it mm -hmm. makes you a bit more likely to vote. And same way how folks would go out and vote for Obama during the presidential campaigns and in a couple uh, months after don't necessarily feel the need to be involved or don't even know who's running for whatever mm -hmm. city council membership. Um, and, and so you've talked quite a bit about parties um, going out, engaging individuals, and, so, and that's one mode of these folks getting informed. Um, any other ideas of how we can give people more access to information, especially where we feel that there's definitely a, a disconnect there, mm -hmm. so they can know who they, who they're voting for and why. Right, got it. Anybody else before I know we've got a break in a couple minutes? Mm -hmm. So in, in this regard, when I think about the concept of the Supreme Court decision that's coming up or the, about one person, one vote, and how that practically yeah. applies versus formalistically, mm -hmm. how do you think that's going to shift the power dynamics when it mm -hmm. comes to how much we rely on local government versus federal government? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for speaking today. Um, so... I'm in the sort of solutions you mentioned on local government mm -hmm. uh, involvement or getting people more involved in, on the local government level, um, I noticed that you didn't talk about um, any sort of proposals to change sort of the timeline of voting, whether moving uh, local elections to correspond with national elections mm -hmm. uh, or moving elections to weekends or... Um, making like some states have early voting periods that last several weeks. And I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on those, if those would be effective for these communities um, or not. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly respond. I think uh, we, are, we break at 10-2. Is that right? So that folks can get... Okay. So... Um, I agree with you in terms of the skepticism, and, and the question is, will folks get engaged in terms of local government? I don't know. I think that, to me, that's the easiest on-ramp, and to me, decentralized movements are best situated to uh, engage with localities, right? Uh, so I, I think that it is inevitable as people kind of develop and learn how to use power and, and kind of existing structures that I think that it is going to happen. I think you've already seen, for example, candidate in Baltimore, right, running for mayor. And I think you will see other uh, people getting involved in terms of the local level. I agree with you that there's almost like this critical race theory approach that Black Lives Matter would have in terms of, okay, well, like, what's the solution? And that there's a heavy criticism as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, heavy emphasis on solutions, right? But I think, A, there are some policy solutions. And, and I think, again, that will evolve as people learn how to use power. Uh, this notion of, and there, there's that, and then also, you know, I have kind of gone out of my way to advise people and recognize that people kind of have to find their way. So there's some more senior people who would kind of try to run to the front of the line. And I think for me, again, you got to kind of defer and let people grow and develop. I think that that's where they'll, they'll likely end up and go. In terms of not informed and how do we kind of deal with, with this, uh, one of the problems like this is the problem with kind of the reformer progressive movement, right? By saying, hey, we're not going to have any parties on the local level to kind of make it all uh, fair, there's a cue that people no longer have in terms of making decisions uh, here, right? Uh, and so uh, some people have suggested that we create 
parties for local levels, not DR parties, but just other types of parties. Uh, also, when we talk about slates and kind of citizens clubs, I think they're all important in terms of voter information. I think it's difficult to say, let's have a test and we're going to depend on everybody to know all this stuff inside and out. I think that the you know, organizations that allow, that are trusted entities that give people cues and how to position them with local elections, I think is, is key here. Uh, I don't know the answer to your question in terms of Ivanwell, in terms of the case that's before the court. Of course, the issue there is a voter basically said, hey, Texas, you can't redistrict by population because you've got a lot of people who are not eligible to vote. Uh, you can't redistrict by total population. We can't apportion by total population. You have to do that by another uh, method, such as those who are eligible to vote or registered voters, right, to uh, ensure kind of equal protection here. Uh, from a practical standpoint, I think it's going to reduce the number of Congressional Hispanic Caucus members, right? And I would imagine that it would do the same in terms of individual districts in states and in localities. So I don't know the federal versus state piece, but I think that across the board, if it, if it goes a certain way, uh, uh, it could uh, result in a fewer uh, Latino electeds of, of color. And then the timing piece. Uh, I think the timing piece is important. If we moved local elections to coincide with presidential elections, right now, 94% of local elections are not, do not coincide with presidential uh, elections. If we were to do that, we'd add 80 million voters to local elections, and we'd add over uh, one estimate, uh, 7,500 minority elected officials uh, to the number of elected officials in the country. Right now, there are about uh, 18,000 minority elected officials. Uh, so we'd add uh, 17, or not 17, uh, 7,500. Uh, so I think that the time, and, and another nice thing about that is that it actually could save money from a uh, resources standpoint because you'd have fewer elections. One of the concerns that local electeds would say, hey, you're not focused on me, you're not focused on my election, that kind of thing. But I do think you'd have you know, more significant uh, turnout and maybe uh, electeds who are more reflective of the, of the nation as a whole. Thank you all for your attention and your time. I appreciate being up here. Thanks so much. <laughs>